Welcome to this video on pediatric musculoskeletal MRI in our series on pediatric radiology. My name is Mary Wires, and this video will go through normal findings typically seen on MRI in the pediatric skeleton. These are the topics for today. The normal appearance of pediatric bone marrow, including examples in different aged patients, as well as a discussion of the normal maturation from hematopoietic marrow to the fatty marrow pattern seen in adults the normal appearance of pediatric cartilage, specifically the unossified epiphyseal cartilage and the cartilage in the physis or growth plate. We will go through a discussion of the MR appearance of normal growth in a long bone through the process of endochondral ossification. Finally, we will include some normal structures and commonly seen variants in the pediatric skeleton on MRI and how to avoid misinterpreting these as disease. We will begin by discussing normal marrow signal and maturation. Pediatric MR imaging can be challenging in the musculoskeletal system due to the differences based on patient age, so it is important to know the age of the patient that you're imaging. Here is a comparison of the two types of marrow. The normal fatty adult marrow is comprised of approximately 80% fat and therefore mostly follows fat signal, so is bright on T1-weighted images and suppresses with fat saturation techniques. It also has less vascularity and does not enhance much following contrast. Normal hematopoietic marrow has less fat, approximately 40%. Because of its higher water content, it is therefore darker on T1 and higher in signal on T2. A good internal reference is the skeletal muscle. Hematopoietic marrow should be similar to or slightly greater in signal to the skeletal muscle on T1-weighted sequences. It will also be slightly greater than skeletal muscle on T2-weighted sequences, but should not be dramatically greater in signal. It also has more vascularity and enhances more after contrast. Here on the left is a 10-week-old patient with predominantly hematopoietic marrow. You can see that the marrow signal in the metaphyses of the proximal femurs is similar to or slightly greater to the skeletal muscle on both T1 and T2-weighted sequences. On the right, we have a 13-year-old knee MRI with a predominantly fatty marrow adult pattern. The marrow demonstrates mostly high T1 signal greater than adjacent skeletal muscle, and mostly low signal on stir, although you can see that some areas are slightly greater than the adjacent skeletal muscle. Because this is not dramatically greater, it is normal. During maturation, hematopoietic marrow is gradually converted to fatty marrow. In the appendicular skeleton, this process begins distally and moves proximally, so the phalanges are the first to convert. The proximal hips and femurs are the last to convert. Within any given tubular bone, there is also a specific order of marrow conversion from hematopoietic to fatty marrow. First, the epiphyses convert to fatty marrow within six months of ossifying. Second, the diaphyses convert to fatty marrow, usually within the first year or two of life. And last, the metaphyses convert to fatty marrow gradually up into adolescence or even adulthood. Since we already know that marrow conversion in the skeleton goes from distal to proximal, the last place to convert in this femur would be in the proximal metaphysis. This also explains why some adult patients can have residual red marrow in the metaphyses, sometimes seen on routine shoulder or hip MRIs. Also note that red marrow reconversion is a reversal of this entire process. Here are some more normal examples. On the left, the femoral head epiphyseal ossification centers have recently formed in this five-month-old. On this T1-weighted image, the femoral head epiphyses are of low signal and are still hematopoietic marrow because they are within six months of being formed. In this slightly older one-year-old patient on the right, the femoral head epiphyses have already converted to fatty marrow. In the axial skeleton, conversion to fatty marrow is slower and red marrow may persist in the thoracic cage, the vertebral column, and pelvis throughout childhood and into adolescence. This is a general guideline for marrow signal in the spine. In children less than one year, the vertebral bodies are typically hypointense to the adjacent disc on T1-weighted images. In children between one and five, the vertebral bodies and discs are isointense. In children greater than five, the vertebral bodies are hyperintense to the adjacent disc. However, marrow conversion is often seen earlier than this typical guideline, and this is normal. Here you can see the vertebral body signal is hypointense to the adjacent discs in this one day old. Note that often the signal you are seeing in the region of the disc may include the disc and the adjacent unossified cartilaginous end plates, depending on the resolution of your scan. In this three year old, the marrow signal is now of higher signal than the adjacent disc and even higher in signal in this 10-year-old. 
Next, we will move on to a discussion of normal cartilage. Unossified epiphyseal cartilage is comprised of disorganized hyaline cartilage, which binds water poorly. Therefore, it is of intermediate signal on T1 and fairly heterogeneous or low signal on T2-weighted images. Some areas are relatively higher in signal on T2, which is normal. The adjacent articular cartilage is more highly organized hyaline cartilage, and so is brighter on T2-weighted images and is clearly distinguished here. Unossified epiphyseal cartilage has vascular canals that radiate out from the center, which may be visualized on postgadolinium sequences in either a speckled or spoke-like pattern, as seen here. This is the patient's ossified femoral head epiphysis. The anatomy of the normal physis is best seen on T2-weighted images, where it has a trilaminar appearance with a central black line sandwiched between two brighter lines. The top white line along the metaphyseal side represents the primary metaphyseal spongiosa. The middle dark line represents the zone of provisional calcification. And the bottom white line towards the epiphyseal side represents the actual physeal cartilage. After contrast administration, there is enhancement around the physis, thought to be predominantly due to the vascular metaphyseal spongiosa. There is also a secondary physis, which is a circular structure around the epiphysis, and has a similar layered appearance, although this is not usually as visible as at the primary physis. The secondary physis allows an epiphysis to enlarge in a circumferential direction. Carpal and tarsal bones are considered epiphyseal equivalents and also have a circular physis surrounding them, allowing them to enlarge circumferentially. Next, we will move on to a discussion of some normal changes seen during growth. We will mainly be discussing longitudinal growth through the process of endochondral ossification, which is how many bones grow and ossify by a cartilage model. This includes the long bones, the vertebral column, and the skull base. The process of bony growth through membranous ossification, such as the facial bones and skull, will not be discussed here. However, the long bones do increase their diameter by membranous ossification through the periosteum. The tubular bones grow longitudinally through the primary physis, and new bone is laid down along the metaphysis. The epiphyses enlarge circumferentially through new ossification along the circular secondary physis. At the beginning of epiphyseal ossification, the cells in the unossified epiphyseal cartilage coalesce, and there is decreased water binding, resulting in a focus of higher T2 signal intensity, which is referred to as a pre-ossification center. The pre-ossification center is well seen in this second metatarsal in the foot of this two-year-old. If you look at the corresponding T1, you will see that no ossified epiphyseal center is visible yet. This is also commonly seen in the trochlea of the elbow and in the distal femoral epiphysis at the knee. Some epiphyses ossify by forming multiple small centers, which may have a fragmented appearance. During growth, these multiple small centers coalesce and fuse together, finally becoming one epiphyseal center. Typical spots where this occurs are the trochlea in the elbow, as in this 8-year-old girl, and the distal femur. You should not see any high T2 signal edema in these circumstances. The appearance of the physis may also change during growth. For example, the distal tibial physis initially has a straight contour, as seen here in this 2-year-old. During growth, the distal tibial physis develops an undulating wavy contour, which can be seen on both plain film and MRI, as in this 10-year-old. The prominent anteromedial superior extension of the physis in the distal tibia has also been referred to as Kump's bump on a plain film. This will represent the normal initial site of physeal fusion. Finally, a normal finding seen during growth is physeal fusion, which is a gradual process during adolescence. The physis may appear asymmetric or you may not see the normal high T2 signal along the entire physis. Here's an example of normal beginning physeal fusion of the distal tibia in a 12-year-old girl, where the central medial aspect of the physis is less visible. This patient also has an incidental non-ossifying fibroma. Contrast the appearance of physeal fusion with a physeal bar, which can form after prior trauma to the physis. On the right, there is a physeal bar along the medial aspect of the distal tibial physis. This patient had a prior fracture of the ankle. If you look at this growth arrest line, you can see it is asymmetric and does not parallel the physis. Therefore, although this physeal bar is small, it will lead to an angular deformity of the ankle over time. You can see the physeal bar even better on this sagittal gradient echo image in the same patient, where there is an absence of the normal bright physeal signal. 
Next, we will move on to a discussion of some normal variants and typical findings seen in pediatrics. Seeing residual red marrow is a frequent occurrence in pediatric musculoskeletal MR imaging. It is good to be aware of certain locations where this more commonly occurs. As previously mentioned, it is common to see residual red marrow in the axial skeleton and in the metaphyses, which are the last places in a long bone to convert to fatty marrow. Two other common locations are the proximal humeral and femoral epiphyses and within the bones of the feet. Here is an example of residual red marrow in the metaphyses of two different patients. You can see the typical linear or flame-shaped appearance of the red marrow, which is perpendicular to the physis and non-mass-like. Here is an example of normal residual red marrow in the proximal humeral epiphysis. It has a typical crescentic configuration along the medial aspect of the epiphysis and is of similar signal intensity to the residual red marrow in the metaphysis of this patient. This should not be confused with avascular necrosis, which would demonstrate flattening or collapse. Here is an example of normal residual red marrow in the bones of the feet. This has a typical speckled appearance with multiple small dots of intermediate T1 signal and higher T2 signal. This appearance has been attributed to red marrow in a perivascular distribution and is often accentuated or made more visible after altered weight bearing or disuse when there is mild surrounding osteopenia, which creates a relative more prominent signal intensity in the red marrow. This is another normal variant sometimes seen in the feet of children. There may be residual embryologic vascular remnants within epiphyses or epiphyseal equivalents. A common location is in the central calcaneus near the sinus tarsi. This should not be confused for a bone lesion. Another normal variant is occasionally seen within the cartilage of weight-bearing joints in children, such as in this knee. Here you can see a dark band of low signal intensity, which can be seen on all sequences. This may be due to displacement of water in the weight-bearing portions of the cartilage. The next normal variant requires an understanding of the normal attachment of the periosteum. The periosteum is normally loosely attached to the long bones in skeletally immature children, except at the physis, where it is continuous with the perichondrium and is more tightly attached. The loose attachment of the periosteum explains why children develop subperiosteal collections, such as subperiosteal abscesses with osteomyelitis or subperiosteal hemorrhages after trauma. However, there is a normal layer of fibrovascular tissue in between the periosteum and the bony cortex of the metaphysis, which demonstrates high signal on T2 and enhances after gadolinium. This is referred to as the metaphyseal stripe on sagittal images or the metaphyseal collar on axial images. This is a normal structure which disappears after physeal fusion and should not be confused with subperiosteal fluid collections. Another variant seen at the knee is the equivalent of the cortical desmoid lesion seen by plain film. This has many names, including distal femoral cortical irregularity and avulsive cortical irregularity. It is at the site of attachment of the medial head of the gastrocnemius, or adductor magnus tendon. It should be recognized based on its classic medial posterior location along the distal femoral metaphysis. It is subcortical and may have an ovoid shape on coronal images. Most of the time, this is an incidental finding. Finally, a normal variant which may be seen in the hands and feet is the pseudoepiphysis, which is an accessory epiphysis. The metacarpals and metatarsals typically grow from only one end. In the case of the first metacarpal, the epiphysis is seen at the proximal end. A pseudoepiphysis may be seen at the non-growing end and often fuses earlier where a notch or cleft may be seen. Thanks for listening, and I hope you are now more comfortable reading pediatric musculoskeletal MRIs.